Hello, it's Tobin, and today we're going to talk a little bit about using next generation JavaScript -y stuff today. Next generation being ES6 or ES2015 or ES Next or whatever the hell they're calling it by the time you watch this. Uh, it's we're going to take a similar approach that we did in my last screencast. In the last one, we talked about using next gen CSS through tooling, essentially, using post-CSS and CSS Next to take that next generation stuff we're writing and dump it back down to current generation stuff, transpile it back down so it'll work in current browsers. So you get the advantages of writing in it and using it, uh, but it'll still work. And when browsers catch up, you can just drop that transpiling step and everything will still work. So we're going to do that with JavaScript. And the tools we're going to use for that are Babel and Browserify. Babel does the bulk of the work. It is what takes roots through all the JavaScript and converts it uh, from what you're writing in, which will be the next generation of JavaScript, and transpiles that back down to current gen so it'll work on, on web browsers. Uh, you need two libraries there because Babel won't handle the import export modular aspect of next generation JavaScript by itself. We're going to use Browserify. We're going to use Babelify as a Babel transform within Browserify. Browserify is going to handle the modular aspect of it. So that's how that's going to run. Uh, one difficulty with the tooling for this kind of thing for JavaScript is speed. Post CSS and CSS Next were extremely fast. And it's not any kind of, it is less of a hindrance in terms of speed than less in SAS and Stylus. So it was very fast. Browserify with Babel, Babelify, not so much. Fairly slow. Uh, if you have a decent size project, uh, you could be looking at 10, 15, 20 seconds of think time for it to transpile that back down to current generation. And that's unacceptably slow. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're in an iterative development process where you just made your 10th change to something to try to get it to work, and you hit control S and you got to wait for 10, 15, 20 seconds, that's not going to fly. That would that would not be totally not be worth it. So we have to get a little clever with Gulp, and we're going to use a plugin called Watchify. And Watchify, what it's going to do is the first when it first starts, it's going to transpile everything, which will take a little time. But after that, it'll only transpile the things that changed. That'll be much much faster. So let's take a look and see how this works. And I think you'll be surprised at how easy it is. Where's the gulp file? And the gulp file, this is, this is what I, I did a little head into monitoring for a while. It's a bit more complicated to do this sort of thing. And the reason why it's more complicated is because we have to be cutesy to get it performant. So we're using Watchify to handle speeding this thing up. And that's just going to handle changing stuff that we just changed after the first run. So we got Browserify, Gulp. The vinyl stuff is, it kind of makes nice between uh, Gulp and NPM modules that really don't handle streams the same way Gulp does. Kind of makes nice between those. And Browserify and Watchify are not uh, written for Gulp and VM modules. So that's what those do. Gulp Util we're just using to catch some arguments and, and process errors if they come up. We're going to do source maps. We're going, there's our Babelify. Uh, the rest is just standard stuff. Gulp Exit we're going to use. So if we're doing a production build, Watchify is like a watch process. So when it runs, it's going to sit there watching after it's done for changes. We're building for production. We don't need to do that. So we use Gulp Exit just to say if we're I'm setting a type of production, just stop when you're done. 
So we're adding some options for Browserify. We're adding Babelify. Saying debug to true for source maps. You don't have to do that if you're kind of source maps. But because we're transpiling, the JavaScript you're going to be debugging is different from the JavaScript you wrote. So source maps here, I would definitely recommend. So I don't want to go bore you going through every line of this. I should say I got most of this from a gulp recipe that the gulp folks have on GitHub. I changed a little bit here and there just for stuff I wanted to do. So we're going to run our bundle. Bundle is a uh, uh, browserify thing. Bundle everything, to, all the modules together. And we're going to pipe it into source maps. If I set a type of production, then we're going to uglify it and exit out of this. And it's going to write out the source map and the, the transpiled and uh, bundled output. So your Gulp file has to get a little bit more creative for this than it does for post-CSS and CSS Next, but it's not too bad. So here's, uh, when you're doing modular development in JavaScript, usually the easiest thing to do is you basically have one file you set your, your uh, transpiling or, or bundling canon at, and it will import the files it needs to run. Those files it's importing may import other files. And because in this modular type of, of method, dependencies are handled, that's all you really need to do. Once it goes fetches that other file, that file knows what other files it needs, and so on and so forth. So we're just porting it at this app.js, and it's going to go import the stuff we need. We're importing from lib1 and lib2, and these are just a couple of... And this is the ES2015 import syntax. It's not all that dissimilar from, say, CommonJS. So you'll look at this. If you're used to CommonJS, it'll make sense to you. Over to lib1, we've got a constant. Constant is another uh, next generation thing. You don't really have constants in current gen JavaScript. We have a couple of functions, and here we're exporting the constant and those two functions. If we didn't export this constant, it would only be available in this lib1 library, not anywhere else, even though it looks like it's being declared globally. This is modular stuff. It's in that particular module. You notice here for this function square, we're setting a default right in the uh, function, function arguments. And that's kind of cool. You can't do that in current gen JavaScript. You have to go to the next line and say, if x is undefined, then set x to whatever, uh, which is a bit of ugly code you don't have to write now. I'm just doing a little bit of math. Lib2 is just doing division. It's using let instead of var. This is another next generation JavaScript thing. Uh, it's going to get transpiled back to var. So, so you don't quite get the benefits of it in this scenario. But the difference between let and var is var is assigned to the nearest and closing function, or if it's outside of function, it's global. Let is assigned to the nearest enclosing anything. And if it's outside of enclosing anything, it's global. That, uh, with var, you can get unexpected variable leakage. Like if, let's see, if you have a for loop inside a function, and you're going for, and then you go var i equals one, you would think that variable i is only available in that for loop, but it's a var is assigned to the nearest and closing function, so it's going to leak out and be all over everywhere in that function. If you say a for loop and then you say let i equals one, that i is only available in that for loop and doesn't leak out anywhere else. I think that's the main difference. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but it's another next generation e JavaScript thing. So that's what we're importing, and we're importing a couple of the exports from those. Like we didn't need that square root constant export from lib1, so we're not importing that. We can import whatever we want. You can say import division as something else if you want. Then we're just doing some console log, a couple things. You notice when we're calling the square function, we're just letting it use the default value there in division. Uh, down here is another next-gen JavaScript thing. 
we have template strings. And you used to not be able to do this. I mean, this isn't inserting anything into it in a template-y kind of way. This is just having a multi-line string. Uh, current gen, you can't do that. You have to do like a uh, you know backslash n, or if you put it on just want stuff on different lines, you have to do a closing quote and a plus, and then put stuff on the next line. Here you're using this uh, backwards apostrophe. I'm sure this has a name, but it's escaping right right now. It closes the text, and you're fine. And this is it. This is our whole thing. So now I start this again. We'll go gulp.js to run this task. And let me just do this as production. So it'll close out Watchify. See, this is very quick. There's these tiny libraries. You'll see this gets much, takes a lot longer when we start adding some different libraries to it. So we got that. Let's go gulp.js just to watch this. We'll pull up our browser. Refresh this page. We just logged a couple things into the console here. Square of default by five. You notice it went to 25, which is perfect. Uh, divide eight by four, eight by two and four. Sounds right to me. So it handled all those imports and it handles all the it handled the default uh, function argument. And handle all that stuff for us, transpile it down so Chrome can run this fine. See, we're, we're doing a, here, let me, back here, let me save this again, there we go. We got our source maps running, so we can, uh, go back and we can see not the JavaScript it's running, but our original source map. It went to that file in that line. So when you're dealing with transpiling JavaScript, you almost have to have source maps because you don't want to try to debug code that you didn't write that the transpiler is writing. You want to debug the code that you wrote. So we got this going. Now let's do some other fun stuff. Go to the console. Let's go back here. We're going to import lodash and jQuery. So now we can run a lodash function. Lodash is basically underscore fast. Uh, if you're familiar with underscore, that's essentially what lodash is. We'll do a little jQuery action. Save this. Because we just put in a couple big libraries, this is going to take quite a while, 5.4 seconds. But supposing we just uh, change this one file and hit Control S, see it's done in a little over a second. And that's what Watchify gives us. It's just dealing with that one file that changed, and we can do this in a performant way rather than have it take an unacceptable amount of time to transpile this stuff. Now let me go back over here. See it's running our jQuery. It ran this little lodash function. Because we're doing import, remember this is modular development. So normally you'd say, well, I stuck lodash in here. I can just jump out to the console and run me some lodash. No, you can't. Because it's modular development, lodash and jQuery in this case are only available in that module. Now, you can do things like suppose lib1 also required jQuery. If I put this requirement over here, see it went 0.9 seconds. And you notice, I, I didn't show you before, but the library didn't, it didn't load jQuery twice. Part of your uh, modular development in handling those dependencies is it resolves those dependencies in a logical way. It's not going to load jQuery 10 times if you have 10 modules that require jQuery. It's going to load it once, 
but now jQuery is available to this module to run jQuery stuff. So that's basically using some next-gen JavaScript today. And I would advise you to go to uh, Babel's Learn ES 2015 and look at a lot of the features. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. Uh, it's pretty cool. And, and you can do this today. Uh, will I do this on my next project? I'm not sure. Uh, probably. The thing that's the most important to me in all this is, is the modular development and dependency management. That's really, really cool. The other stuff is kind of gravy. And in terms of modular development, dependency management, and import and export, uh, the next generation stuff works, but if you did say common JS instead, and that's all you wanted, you could just do common JS with Babelify. Not only would it transpile much faster by itself, uh, it would, or browserify, just use it with browserify, not only really transpile fast without having to do Babelify, you also get the advantage of common JS. You can use that in Node server side as well. So, I don't know. Might use it, might not. But you can use it, and it's not too bad. And as long as you're a little bit creative with your gulp file, uh, the speed is acceptable. You can get it so it's, it's not a crazy long time. Because if something's taking 10 seconds during an iteration cycle, that's practically unusable for... Maybe I'm just impatient, but I don't think that's very usable. Anyway, next generation stuff with Browserify and Babelify and using Watch and, uh, with Gulp to speed that along. And uh, there you go. That's the CSS end of it and the JavaScript end of it. You are officially from the future. See it.